This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Like I said, best behavior, everybody. So let's begin with Parshat Bahar. Uh, Marta, why don't you take it for us in Hebrew? No, we don't hear you, Marta. Sorry, I, I, I was now we do. But yet, the bear has shed no more share, but has seen I lay more. The bear of an Israel, the Amata Elehem, Kitavo, Ella Aritz, Ashera Nino Ten Lahem, the Shaftaha Aritz, Shabbat Lashem. Sheshanim Tizra, Sadaha, the Sheshanim Tizmor. One more pasuk. Hashem Shiva Lashem Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Kathy in English, please. Hashem spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, the land shall observe a Sabbath rest for Hashem. For six years, you may sow your field and for six years, you may prune your vineyard and you may gather in its crop. But the seventh year shall be a complete rest for the land, a Sabbath for Hashem. Your field you shall not sow, and your vineyard you shall not prune. Beautiful. So we have over here the mitzvah. Now we see you, Rose. Good. We have over here the mitzvah of Shemitah of the seventh sabbatical year. Now, just as an aside, for those who are unsure who challenge the validity or the divinity of the Torah. Let's imagine that the 10, 12 of us are getting together now and we're going to write a Torah. It's not really from God, but we're going to write a Torah because if it's not from divine, if it's not divine, it means some people got together and wrote it. I mean, those are the two options. Either it was divine from God, or some people got together to write it. And we're thinking, what should we put into this Torah? So we say, uh, how about a day like Shabbat, a day of rest? Oh, that's a good idea. People need to rest. Okay, and any, um, any self-respecting religious book has to have some sacrifices in there. All right, we'll put in sacrifices. And holidays, you have to celebrate. Great, great idea. Holidays, celebrate. Let's have some ritual things. Yeah, ritual things are important. Let's put in some tefillin, maybe. Let's, yeah, yeah, all these things are good ideas. And then along comes Cena with a great idea. Hey, let's tell everybody not to plant every seventh year. And you say, uh, yeah, but that's, that, that could be a problem, Senior. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, what are they going to eat? Ah, uh, no problem. You know what we'll do? Here, just look up ahead for uh, a minute. Go to page 700, right, which is the same chapter 25, verse 20. And... I have the answer, because you say, wait, we can't tell them not to plant the seventh year. What are they going to eat? Verse 20, page 700. People are going to ask, what are they going to eat the seventh year? We're not planting, we're not gathering to Atenu. Don't worry. We'll write in the Torah that God said, I'll give you my blessing on the sixth year. And the sixth year, God will tell them that the sixth year will have enough produce for the end of the sixth year, the seventh year, and the start of the eighth year, right? When they can start planting again. Uzratem, 22, and they'll plant the eighth year, and they'll eat from the old stuff. 
And then by the ninth year, the eighth stuff will start to grow and everything will be fine. Great idea, right? That's what Senior wants to put into our little Torah that we're writing. What's the problem with Senior's idea over here? You can't guarantee that. <laughs> I'm going to write in this Torah, don't plant the seventh year, and I'm going to guarantee God's going to send a blessing. But remember, there's no God. We're writing the Torah. So how do you make it, right? How could anyone, any human being, writing the Torah, how could they, why would they make such a preposterous claim that, as Kathy said, we can't guarantee that, right? So off the bat, just as an aside, this is, I don't like to use proofs of God, proofs of the Torah's divinity, because there are no ironclad proofs because we have to have our free will. Just like when the, when, the, the, when the sea split for the children of Israel to pass through. Oh, now we see you, Cheryl, good. When the sea split for the children of Israel to pass through and the water came cascading down on the Egyptians, there was a very strong easterly wind blowing. Why? Because that's, things are obfuscated. Things are covered. We have to have our free wills. So I don't want to use this as a proof. But certainly to me, right, the choice is people wrote it, saying God wrote it, or God wrote it. And for me, right, this is one of the points that's often made, that for people to write this Torah and to put in this ridiculous, ridiculous guarantee that there's no way that they could possibly ensure, right, is um, we wouldn't do it. If we were the group, right, we decided we're going to write this Torah, right, this would certainly not be in there, as are a number of other things also. What is the idea of this mitzvah of Shviyat, of Shemitah? So keep in mind, when you will come to the land, that's when this is, right? This is going to be a whole different existence for us. Meaning, in the Midbar, we were living a very miraculous day-to-day -day existence. What did we eat? Manna fell from the heaven. What did we drink? Remember the book, Soup from a Stone? So it wasn't soup from a stone, but it was water from a stone. That's what we are drinking, right? We are living this, this supernatural existence. And later on, we get to Bamidbar and we come to the issue of the maraglam of the spies, right? We, we'll, we'll gain an understanding that people were afraid to go into the land of Israel, not just afraid of the battles, but afraid of the internal battles, that we would have to fight. Meaning, we all have these internal battles that we have to fight. Do we see God's hand? Do we see God's blessing? Or is it nature? Or is it just, this is the world, right? If I'm doing well financially, is it a blessing from God or am I a smart guy? I'm a smart investor, right? If everything's going well, is it, my lucky day? Is it thank goodness or is it thank God? These are the struggles that we always have. And these struggles began once we entered into the land of Israel. Because once we're in Israel, it's going to be a natural existence but as we always say, nature is miracles that we've grown bored with, that we've become accustomed to, right? You take a, 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 a city kid who's never been out to a farm, right? and he thinks, he thinks that fruits and vegetables grow in Albertsons. That's where they grow. You take them out to a farm and you show them, you're taking a seed, you're putting it into the ground. And out from that seed comes melons and carrots and all these fruits and vegetables and trees. 
trees that will produce other fruits. Miraculous, but we grow accustomed to it. So that, yeah, of course that happens. But man from the heaven, of course, that would be miraculous. So the challenge is going to be once we enter the land to keep our focus, because that's what we are meant to be. We are meant to be human beings living in this world. We're not living in a miracle world. We're living in a natural world, but we have to see through the world mask and see the hand of God in all that goes on. And that's going to be the challenge. You know, before we say the Amidah, we take three steps back. The Amidah is part of the davening. We take three steps back and three steps forward, right? Why are we doing this little dance? before we do our Amidah. What's the purpose of these three steps back, three steps forward? So classically understood, we're taking three steps forward because we are moving into a different zone. Meaning, until that point in our davening, we're talking about God. Now comes the Amidah, that is a very, very intimate speaking to God. That's why if someone is saying Shema, you could walk in front of them, not a problem. If someone's saying the Amidah, you're not allowed to walk in front of them. So if you walk in front of them, you are interrupting your, like if two people are talking, it's rude to walk in between, isn't it? Well, this person's talking to God, the Shekhinah, the divine presence is in front of them. Don't walk in the middle, don't walk in front. Right? This person's in the middle of a conversation. Right? You know, we, we always first do the right and then the left. The right takes on more importance in a Kabbalistic sense. The right represents chesed, kindness. The left is din, judgment. We want the, the kindness to override the judgment. Always right before left. Yet when we finish Amidah, we take three steps back and we first bow to the left. O Seshalom bin Ramav. To the right. Hu ya Seshalom Aleinu. Why are we bound to the left first? Why are we there to the left and not to the right? We always do the right first. Why after the Amidah are we bowing to the left first? Anyone want to venture a guess on this? Because we're bringing ourselves back to reality. Yeah, but why bow to the left instead of to the right? That's why we're taking steps back, I agree. But why bow to the left instead of to the right? We always first bow to the right and then left. Why over here after the Amidah do we bow to the left and then to the right? It is to the right. Who's right? God's right. <laughs> God's in front of us. So we're bowing to the right. If it's my right or his right, guess who's right? Uh, over overrules. Right? We bow to God's right. Yes. All right. Can you say again the right stands for chesed and kindness, and the left side, uh, what does is, that represent? Is din, is din and gvura, is judgment and, uh, and 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 strength. Right. So we want the chesed to override the din. Uh, I think in uh, uh, the Seder, in, in Pesach, we lean to the left. While yes, good. Are good, 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 good point. Connect. Yeah, so th that doesn't. There, the leaning is is supposedly more is is, is more for medical reasons uh, that that when they would eat, that's how they would lean. Yeah, not not for Chesed and Gevura. So again. <laughs> So we take three steps forward because we're entering into a different zone, right? We're now entering into a completely different realm. We're speaking directly, intimately to God. But why do we take three steps back? So it might be a very, a very practical thing, right? Well, you know, otherwise you need, you need a bigger shul, right? Everyone's moving forward, right? We take three steps back, three steps forward, Right, but a, 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 a better than just the practical reason that's given. We take three steps back because, so to speak, God took steps back. God has concealed his presence from us. God took steps back. By the Amidah, what are we doing, right? We say, remember the who, we won't be fooled again. We're not going to be fooled by God hiding himself. What do we do? 
we take three steps forward, we won't be fooled. We know it's you. And that is the struggle that we all have. And that was we transitioned into this struggle once we enter the land of Israel. And therefore, we need to see the Kedusha, the holiness, the sublime, the spiritual that exists in the natural. And that's why our seven-day week goes into a Shabbat. And our seventh month, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Av, Elul, Tishrei, our seventh month has in it Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Atzeret. The seventh is, always, seventh is natural, and we have to have the holiness in the natural. So we have the day, we have the month, and we have the year. The seventh year is Shemitah, is this holy, consecrated year that you don't act as an owner. I'm allowed to eat the fruits of my field, but so are you. I have no greater claim to it than anyone else. I can t bring some of that produce into my barn to feed my animals, into my house to feed my family, as long as there's still produce out in the field to feed the wild animals and to feed the other people who come to take for their families. Once there's nothing left in the field, I can't have in my house because that's acting as an owner. The operative word in that very second, in the second verse was, on page 696, Pasuk Bet, speak to the children of, of Israel and say to them, Ki tavo el ha'aretz, will you come to the land, asher ani noten lachem, the land which I am giving to you. Recognize you're on my land. And the way that we recognize that we're on God's land is by following his directives, right? Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, were in God's garden. And they didn't follow the directives that were given to them, which meant they were not acknowledging that they're living in God's world. So Shemitah is a way of acknowledging, if we'll go back to where I read before on page 700, right? It says over there, verse 23, Pasuk Chav Gimel, verse seven, page 700. This is talking about the din of Yovel. Yovel is the Jubilee, the 50th year. And on that year, any if I sold the, the ancestral senior land, it comes back to me at, at Yovel. The Pesach says, Chav Gimel, Va'aris lo timacher litzmitut. The land cannot be sold in, in uh, forever, in perpetuity. Ki li ha'aretz. God says, why? Because the land belongs to me. Ki geirin toshavim. Atem imadi, you are geirim v'toshavim. How do they define that best? Where is that? Twenty-three sojourners and residents. You are with me, geirim v'toshavim. We're guests, we're guests. And as I often say, when I walk into a supermarket and I either check my CRC app, the Chicago Rabbinical Council to see, does this need a hechsher? Does this need kosher certification? Certain things don't. Flour does not, sugar does not. Certain things don't need certification. And then I check to see the certification, that's Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden 
understanding what they are allowed to be eaten, sorry, eating or not, right? That's what it is. It's recognizing that we are in God's world. And Shemitah is a test of our faith that we trust, we recognize we're in God's world, God's land, and we are not going to gain, we are not going to gain by going against what he directed us to do. So if we think we'll eat the seventh year by planting, we won't eat the seventh year by planting. And in fact, there were 70 Shemitot that Israel did not properly keep. Corresponding to that were the 70 years of the Babylonian exile. If you don't recognize that this is my land and I gave it to you, so what is so what so what is the natural consequence of that? You won't be in the land. And then you'll realize that it's not yours gratis, it's not just yours. It's a gift. It's a gift with conditions, and the conditions are acknowledging, appreciating, and following those guidelines. But recognizing I am not going to lose out by doing the right thing. I'll just share with you a beautiful story that uh, at the shloshim of my brother, Josh, Yeshua Shalom, and Dever Yirmiyahu, let the story be in his, in his zechus, in his merit. So many people spoke, and his sons-in-law spoke. He has two sons-in-law, two married daughters. And one of them spoke and said, what I gained most from Abba, right, from my brother, from his father-in-law, was perspective. And he explained, my, my brother, Lava Shalom, was a caterer. And he wasn't, uh, he wasn't er earning big money. And very often he was, he lives in Baltimore, lived in Baltimore. Nally and I lived there our first year of marriage, as did they, as Josh and my sister-in-law, they were, we were neighbors. And we ended up moving then to Israel, then to New York, then to California. And they just, they remained in Baltimore all of those, uh, all of those decades, actually, all of those years. And Baltimore is a big Jewish community, and there are a lot of caterers, a lot of Jews making affairs and a lot of caterers. So my brother earned, an, earned a living, but, but, you know, it often was a bit of a struggle. There was a young guy who moved to the neighborhood who wanted to go into catering. So my brother is sort of training him, is showing him the ropes. So the son-in-law said, I said to him, I said, Abba, you're already struggling. Why are you training more competition? Why are you doing that? And he said, and my father-in-law Josh said to me, he said, oh, thanks for pointing that out to me. I didn't realize that God can give me Parnassa and another person also Parnassa. I didn't realize God, he can't possibly sustain me and another person also. So thanks for pointing that out to me. I also didn't realize that by doing an act of kindness to another Jew and helping him get on his feet, God's going to punish me and take away my livelihood. Thanks. I didn't realize that. <laughs> and that's really what Shemitah is, right? Shemitah is recognizing that we're not going to lose out. We're not going to lose out by doing what is proper, what is right. And this is the conditions for entering the land, remaining in the land. This is the bracha. It's the blessing. Think of it like that also. Shabbos, don't work the seventh day. And double man fell on the sixth day. So you don't have to gather. It's a blessing. The blessing is you'll earn what you're supposed to earn in a week in six days. Great. Great. If someone would call you and say, listen, just work two days a week. Bill Gates gives you a call and says, what are you earning? How many days are you working? You're working five days a week, six days a week? I guarantee your salary. Just work two days, and I guarantee your same salary. Thanks. 
Thanks. Work on my forehand, work on my backhand. Great. Right? Sounds wonderful. Okay? So that's what Shabbat, that's what Shemitah is. In, if you need seven years of produce for every seven years. Work six and you'll get seven. Not Bill Gates. God. Nice. But Shemitah is seeing, recognizing the holiness that exists in that which seems to be natural, in that which seems to be mundane. Now, I spoke on Friday night uh, on, on, online, of course, in between before Kabbalat Shabbat. And I spoke a little bit about Roshim Yochai, and I spoke about fire. Right? The big thing on, on Lagba Omer is to light bonfires. And bonfires, fire is an amazing thing. You had a dead piece of wood. You had this dead branch. And all of a sudden you put fire to it and you realize this dead branch is not dead. It is completely packed with energy with illumination, with heat. It looks like, from the outside, it looks like it's dead, but it is filled with fire. It is filled with energy. Roshim Ben Yochai, we'll see the story in just a moment. We'll go over there now. He is the author of the Zohar. What does Zohar actually mean? What does Zohar mean? Aura, help us out. Glow. Glow, uh-huh. right? Glow, effervescence, light, illumination. Yeah. The book of Zohar, of, of, of Kabbalah, is to show us the holiness that exists in everything in the mundane, in the regular. So I like to, he wrote the Zohar, or not wrote, but composed it when he was in a cave for 12 years. So let's go, I'm gonna share my screen, and we're going to go through the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Oh yeah, not that, one second. Don't wanna do that. Want to do this? Share screen, Chrome tab. Let me know that it has come up. Does everybody see that? Is the screen there? Somebody unmute and let me know. Do you see that? Yes. yes. Rabbi, did you say yes. it was on page 33 of Shabbat? 33 yes. of Shabbat. Okay, thank you. Okay, you have you probably have Melvin's Gemara from when I studied with him on Shabbos. So you can look over there. Okay, so let's hear this story. Okay, I'm going to move the screen. So basically the very top line that you see is where we're reading from. In the middle of that line. Diyatvi Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon. These three great sages, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, Yatve were sitting convening the yacht of Yehuda ben Gerim Gavayu. And there was a fellow by the name of Yehuda ben Gerim. Yehuda, he was child of converts. He was sitting with them. Patach Rav Yehuda v'amaru. Yehuda began speaking and said, Kama na'im ma'aseyem shal umazu. Speaking about the Romans who were then controlling Israel and controlling the Jewish people, how nice are their actions? There, it's an amazing country. We'll often say that, right? America, and, and we, we mean it. America is an amazing country. It's given us amazing freedoms and opportunities. They said, Tiknu Shvakim. They set up these great marketplaces, wonderful malls. Tiknu Gisharim, great bridges. They established bridges. Tiknu Merchatzaot. They established bathhouses, right? They've really, really, they run a great country. They do a great job. That was Rabbi Yehuda's statement. Rabbi Yossi Shatak, 
Rabbi Yossi didn't want to agree, did not want to disagree. He remained quiet. Ne'ener of Shimon Yochai. Shimon Yochai responded, V'amar, and he said, that's not true. Kol ma shetiknu, lo tiknu ela l'tzorech atman. Whatever they established, they established for their own good. Tiknu shvakim, they have marketplaces. Lo shiv bahen zonot. That's in order to have women of ill, of Ill repute available there. Mer chatzot, they have houses. Ladein bahen atzman, in order to in order to pamper themselves. Gisharim, bridges, lito mehen meches. They want to collect. They want to collect on the toll rolls. They want to collect their tolls. Rabbi Yishim Yochai saw things straight, black and white, emet, truth. Halach Yehuda ben Geirim, the fellow who was there observing these three great rabbis and their different views, he went to Siper Divarayim, and he went and he told over this amazing conversa- conversation that he was privy to hearing. However, this one told that one, and that one told this one, V'nishma'u Malchut. And in the end, the Roman authorities heard about what each of them said or didn't say. Amru, they said, Yehuda She'ila, Yehuda, who spoke in favor, who praised us, Yit Ale, he will be raised up to an important position in our Roman structure. Yossi Sheshatak, Yossi, who is quiet, Yigale, he doesn't want to speak in favor of us, exile, send him out. Litsipori, let him go to Tsipori. Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Yochai, Shegina, who had the audacity to disgrace us, to speak badly about us, Yehareg, he will be put to death. Azal hu ubre, or Shimon and his son went, Tashu be Medrasha. He didn't want to go home. They hid in the Beit Medrash, in the study hall. Kol yom avi mighty luhu de Beitu rift of Akuza de Maya. Vikarche. Every day his wife would bring him some bread and some water. Vikarche, and they would literally fold the bread. They would eat. Ki takif gezeirata, when the gezeir, the decree demanding his head, his death, became tighter and stronger. Amle Lebre said to his son, I'm concerned. Nashim dait in kalan aleyim dilam etzarila umagalyalan. I'm afraid they might torture her and, they'll, and she'll give away her, our, our location. So it's interesting. The Gemara says, women dait and kalot. Women, their, their minds are, are, are light, which is not meant to be understood that they are light of intellect. Actually, it is a praise to women. Meaning, right, men, we get involved in doing something, and what happens? We can't do anything else, right? You know, the, the house is burning, but we're, but we're putting a screw into the garage wall, so therefore, the screw goes into the garage wall and the baby's crying and this is going on, but don't, don't, don't talk to me now. Whereas a woman, Daitan Kalot, their minds are light and easy. They take care of the kids as they're doing their work, as they're preparing dinner, as the phone call comes in, they're able to what we, what we now call multitask. Whereas men are like, oh, don't talk to me right now. I'm doing X, right? And then no other letters in the alphabet. When I'm doing X, that's all that can be done. So he was afraid, he was afraid that she would give away, they would torture her and give away his location. What did they do? Azlu Tashu Bima'arata. They went and they hid themselves in a cave. Itrachish Nisa, a miracle took place. Ivru Luhu Charuva and a carib tree was created there. The Aina Demaya, and there was a spring of water. So they had caribs and water upon which they would subsist. 
Vavi Mishalchi Manayu. They took off their garments, Vavi Yatvi Atsavarayu Bichala. And they would they cover they sat in sand, they covered themselves in the ground. Ad Savarayo until their necks. Kula Yama Garse. And they would sit and learn the entire day. Be'idan Suluye, when it was time to Davin, Levushe, Lavshu, they would put their garments on, Mirsu, cover themselves, Umatslu, and pray. Because they knew they were in there for the long haul and the garments would get completely worn out. So they wanted to save the garments for when they were davin, when they were praying to stand properly in front of God. And then afterwards they would take off the garments in order that the garments would not get worn out. They remained there. Tresar Shanei B'ma'arata. They were in the cave for 12 years. After 12 years, Atta Eliyahu, Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah the prophet came, the Kam, and stood, Apitcha de Marata, by the entranceway of the cave, Amar, and he said, Man lo who will inform Le Bar Yochai, who will inform Bar Yochai, Demayat Kesar, that the Caesar has died. And along with his death was the annulment of any death decrees that he had issued. Ubatel Gezerate. And the decree for the life of Rosh Yochai has been canceled, annulled. It's safe to come out now. Nafku. So Rosh and his son exited the cave. Chazu Inchi. And he saw people, de kakarbe vizare, who were plowing and planting. But they had just been in this intense spiritual place where there was no need to do anything. The carob trees were there. The water was there. They were living this, as we discussed before, before we entered the land of Israel. They were living like in the Midbar, in the desert, with the man coming from heaven and the water coming from the stone. They were living this, this supernatural existence. And they saw people who were bothering themselves with such mundane things, like plowing and planting. Amri, they said, Menichin Chaye Olam. They are ignoring Chaye Olam, eternity, eternal life. The Oskin Bechaye Sha'a. And they're involving themselves in these temporal passing issues. Why? Kol Makom Shenotnin Eneim, wherever they cast their eyes, Miyad Nisraf. It went up in flame. Perhaps, perhaps, right? They saw the fire that was inside everything and said, why are you dealing with the outside, with the external? Yatsta batkol. A heavenly voice came out for Amr Lehem and said to them, Lahachariv olami yatsatem. To destroy lahachariv olami, my world, yitzatem. Have you come out to destroy my world? Go back into the cave. Hadur, Azul, they returned. Etivu, and they remained in the cave. Tracer Yarche, Shata, for 12 months, for a year. Amri, they said, we have a teaching, Mishpat Rishayim B'Gehenim Yud Bet Chodesh. Even evildoers, they only remain in Gehenna, in hell, in purgatory for 12 months. That's why we say Kaddish for someone, for, for parents for 11 months. Because we're not assuming that they need 12 months of the Kaddish. Yatzta Batkol, the heavenly voice came out of Amr and said, Su'u mi ma'aratchem. Go out from your cave. Indra, it just struck me now. I wonder why the first time around it was Elio and Navi, and this time it was a heavenly voice. Something to think about. Nafku, they went out. Kol Machi, Rabbi Lazar. 
Rabbi Lazar, the son, he still couldn't take it. Wherever he would look, he would burn. Havimase Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon would heal. Amar lo, and he said to him, Bini, my son, dai lo lam, ani va'ata. It's enough in this world, I and you. I, we can exist on this level. Everyone else, let them be. Bahade Panya, the Male Shabbata. It was the afternoon of Male Shabbat of Arab Shabbat. One day, a few days later, whenever that was, Chazu Hahu Saba, they saw a Saba, a grandfather, an older man. Davi Tre Madane Asa, holding two bundles of Asa, of myrtle leaves, Hadasim. Virahit. And this old man is running, as the day, as Friday, is coming to an end. The sun is about to set. Amrulay, they said to him, Hanach Lamalach, Hani Lamalach, what are these for? Amrulay said to them, Lichvod Shabbat, to give honor to Shabbos. They said to him, Vitiske Lecha Bechad, why do you need two bundles? Why is one not sufficient for you? And he answered, Chad keneged zachor, bechad keneged shamor. There are two aspects of Shabbos. There is the remembering of Shabbos, the doing of Shabbos, and there's the shamor, the safeguard of the things that we don't do on Shabbos. Zachor and shamor, right? We light two candles on Shabbos, minimally two candles. Many have the custom to add on one more candle for each member of the family. But minimally, we light two candles, Zachar and Shamor. So he, the, the older man explained, I have two bundles to honor Shabbos properly, one for Zachar and one for Shamor. Amalei Libre, he said to his son, Chazi, do we see? Kama chavivin mitzvot al Yisrael. How dear are the mitzvot to Israel? How the Jews embrace how much they love these mitzvot, yativ datayu, and their minds were at ease. They were no longer troubled anymore. So we see a fascinating thing over here. We see that they went from burning everything up to the sun burning and him healing, saying, dai la'olami, la'olam, Anivata, you and I are enough in this world. And then there was a next stage when they saw this older person, this older person running to give honor with, to Shabbos with two bundles. It's not enough to have one bundle, two bundles, one for Zachor and one for Shamor. And it's very, very, it's, it's something that, you know, religious zealotry, right, is if anyone is doing, you know, there's normal. What's normal? Me. What I do, that's normal. Anyone who does more than that, eh, they're a little, uh, they're overdoing it, a little, a little overdoing it. And anyone who does less than me, eh, they're not quite where they should be, right? They're not, they're not as engaged, right? But guess, guess who has it just right? You guessed it, me. <laughs> I've got just right. I'm the perfect balance. I'm not too right. I'm not too left. I'm not too extreme. I'm not too lax. I'm not too casual. I'm just right. Everyone else, unless they're exactly like me, is either a little too extreme or a little too lax. Right? That's where the religious zealotry comes in. Yes, all right. It's interesting to me that when uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, let them be, they started seeing actually someone going with uh, honoring the Shabbat. But before they saw only, let's say, um, uh, how would they say it? They looked negatively. They saw only negative things people were doing. Exactly. 
Exactly. Right. But at first, I'm sorry, go on, Aura. No, no, no. I have a, a couple of questions after that. Yeah. So at first, at first, right, anyone who's not on our level, right, and just realize it was during quarantine, during isolation, that they were uh, reached this level, right, something to think about. But anyone who wasn't on their level, there was no place in the world for them. Nisraf got burnt up. What are they doing? Who are they? Completely dismissive. Completely dismissive. Almost to the point, like we said, there's no place in the world for them. Right? And, and we, we have such religious zealotry today, not amongst our people, but, you know, if you are not, right, keeping, if you don't believe in exactly what we believe in, so for some it is, right, we'll kill you. You deserve to be put to death. For others, it could be eternal damnation. If you don't believe in exactly what we believe in, there's no place in the world for you. There's no place for you. They went back into the cave. They went back into the cave for 12 months. When they came out, it was a step in the right direction, which was they can live wherever Rabbi Lazar would look and burn, Rabbi Shimon would look and heal, meaning you can live, you can exist, right? It's enough for the world to have, the world has me and you. That's enough. Is If the world has two people who have it right, that's okay. Everyone else has it wrong. Everyone else is missing the boat, missing the point. But it's okay. They can also live. Mm -hmm. There's place in the world for them, even though they are hopelessly misguided. Even though they are blind. They're, even though they're oskin b'chaye shah, even though they're so involved in the temporal, temporary, fleeting world, and they're ignoring eternity, okay, nebuch, we would say, right? Mizken, sad, sad that they're so misguided. Okay, but we're not going to burn them up. What will we do? We'll pity them. We'll feel sorry for them. That was the interim stage until they saw this older person running on Erev Shabbos with these two bundles in order to honor Shabbos in a complete manner. Yatsvi Datayu, then their minds were at ease. Then they recognized there are different ways for different people to be serving God. It's not one size fits all. And if they are doing their best and they're honoring Shabbos with those two myrtle branches and they're running to honor Shabbos in their way, call a kavod lahem. It's no longer nebuch, miskein, oh, poor lost souls. No, it's they are bringing something to the table. They are showing us something that we didn't realize. They're showing us an aspect of way of serving God that's uplifting to us. The Gemara in Tan, it says, Latid Lavo, all the righteous will form a circle around God. Right? The idea of a circle is every point on a circle is equidistant from the center. And they're going to realize, and they're going to move around in this dance circle, which means I'm standing in my place, now I'm standing in your place, and then in your place, and in your place, in your place. And everyone is standing in the other one's place and is appreciating their 
way of serving God, their connection to God, what they, what they brought to the table, so to speak, their, their connection and recognizing not everyone needs to connect in exactly the same way as me. For this one, it might be study. For this one, it might be chesed. For this one, it's studying halacha. For this one, it's studying kabbalah. Right? Everyone has their aspects where they shine. We're each different, and our serving God is going to look different for each and every one of us. Ori, you want to say something before and I cut you off? I apologize. No, uh, I, I'm just curious. So total it would be 13 years in the cave, right? Because they went back for one more year. So it looks Correct. like they got some time out sitting in the cave thinking about what's going on and, and they came out back back out realizing live and let live kind right. of thing. Right. The other thing Live is, and let live, but, but but the next stage was not just live and let live, but live and respect the way others are living. Right. Yeah. And um, so how old was Rabbi uh, Bar Yochai when he entered the, the, the cave? Do we know? And, and hmm. how old was he when he died? I don't know offhand. I will try to do a little bit investigation and see if we do or don't know. Uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva was, I think, 40 or 48 when he began to... He was 40 when he started to study. To study, yeah. Right. I'm interested and in... And he was away for 24 years, and that's when he became the, the great Rabbi Akiva, 24 years of study, which puts uh -huh. him at 64 when he was the great 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 rabbi akiva right and he was he was tortured to death by the romans for teaching torah publicly i don't know if we know either but according uh, how old he was excuse me at his death mm -hmm. yeah i'm interested to know about bao too yeah yeah, yeah. we uh, yeah i will do my best to to uh to do a little a little scouting around, I might even ask Rabbi Google and see what what what, what it comes up with. <laughs> okay, my friends, we will call it over here. Everybody have a good day, a Shavua Tov, a good week. Um, we will be rejoining. We have the more class in the morning, uh, but we will be rejoining Thursday with lunch and learn with a lot of interesting sources, still continuing to focus this week on Lagba Omer. Okay, so that'll be Thursday at 12.30. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. We'll be calling it Lunch and Learn. It's, it's Learn, but the lunch is on you. But uh, we will get back to also supplying the lunch. Uh, please, God. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Great seeing you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Be well. Bye.